So let's take a closer look at the trim. So we're using FS Force, that means FS Force is going to manage the elevator trim for us. We need to make sure that we unmap any controls that we've got set up for controlling the FSX elevator trim. So any buttons or switches typically on the yoke or if we're using a trim wheel we must disconnect those. You can use an analog trim wheel for controlling FS Force. The instructions, I'm not going to go into how to do that in detail. I'm using a digital trim wheel which essentially is an encoder switch. It is actually the SciTech Cessna trim wheel but I've hacked it so that I can use it as an encoder and that's because I mean you may or may not be aware that using a absolute positioning or analog trim control with the, the autopilot doesn't really work very well. If you disconnect all your mappings for elevator trim then what you need to do is map the control that you want to use, in my case the elevator trim encoder switch to the elevator up and down trim functions in FS Force and you can find out how to do that in the FS Force documentation and once you've done that the elevator trim control is going to be intercepted by FS Force and it's going to manage the center position of the yoke in the pitch axis as we've described earlier. Now there's one slight wrinkle which is it's going to do that when you're in the air. On the ground what you're going to find is the control that you've mapped to FS Force's up and down elevator trim functions will actually be passed through to the FSX elevator trim functions. What that means is if I were to look in the virtual cockpit, this is the island of the unfortunately the trim controls behind <laughs> the throttles. The trim indicator is right there. I'm on the ground. If I move my elevator trim control, it's actually moving this indicator and you can see the trim wheel over here as well. When I'm in the air, that, that doesn't happen. FS Force detects whether it's on the ground or in the air. And the only reason it has that function is so you can centre up the FSX elevator trim while you're on the ground. I suppose, you know, in a slightly more sophisticated sense, it does allow you to choose the default trim setting for when the yoke is centred. And you could have a very nose up attitude trimmed or a very nose down. If, I don't know why you would want to do that, but it's possible. So really in terms of FSX built-in elevator trim, that, that's uh, the whole story. You know, it's set once and forget. And in fact, you should never need to set it because when you load the aircraft, the trim will be set to default or takeoff trim anyway. FS Force gives us an indication of the current trim setting. Obviously, there's an indication in terms of where you see the, the yoke positioned, but there's also a a little gauge that's installed in each aircraft and it pops up in the bottom right hand corner every time you move the, the trim wheel and if you were following that description of the FSX elevator trim you'll notice that when I move this wheel because I'm on the ground it tells us that it's changing the FSX elevator trim not the FS Force elevator trim and actually if I hold down the shift key while I'm doing that it changes the FS Force elevator trim not the FSX one. So just to recap, when we're on the ground, moving the trim control changes the FSX elevator trim and you'll see indications of that in the cockpit because the trim control will move. If there's a trim indicator that will move. When we're in the air, moving the trim wheel changes the FS Force elevator trim, which is the elevator trim that flies the yoke on the aircraft. If that doesn't make sense, you need to play with it, and uh, you know it's a quite a simple concept once you get it, but uh, it's kind of difficult to explain. Right, we're going to take off. We're going to fly it around the block and just demonstrate setting the trim. That Cessna's doing touch and goes in front of us. <laughs> so let's get up in the air. Let's chase that Cessna. Right, so he's levelling out. I want to level out as well. I'm having to push to hold that. So I'm going to push. I'm now going to trim forward. 
to land. Can stop pushing. There we go. We're now in a much more forward position. Actually, we're diving now. And we're overtaking the guy because we're doing 120 knots. There he goes. And we're climbing again. We'll trim it to fly straight and level. So still wanting to climb. Give it a little bit more of a forward trim. There it is. So if we want to do the opposite now, let's say we want to climb maximum rate climb, which is going to we're going to need 65 knots for that. If I pull back, I'm going to pull back and just hold it. So I'm in a stable climb at about 65 knots. I'm having to pull quite hard, that's 80 knots. So we'll go for 70 rather than 65, so I'm pulling quite hard. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to hold it there, I'm going to trim back. Looking at the speed gauge as well, trying to hold it there. I'm still having to hold it substantially. If I let go, it's going to, it still wants to go forward, so trim a bit more. I can feel that pressure is easing off, it's just about eased off now. If I let go, we should be okay. So there we are, and the yokes, you know, it's moved, I don't know, a few inches further back. We can still go a bit further. And then if we want to go back to straight level at 120 knots, let's do the opposite. Push it forwards. Now in this case we have to wait till it builds up a bit of speed before we really have to push. Okay, I'm starting to feel the pressure now. It's pushing back because it doesn't want to settle down. Pushing hard. 95 knots, pushing really hard. The yoke's moved. Pushing, pushing. Still climbing slightly. Okay, I'm going to try and start to trim it now. Still having to push. Okay, I can feel that pressure easing. Still pushing a little bit. There it goes. And the pressure's pretty much trimmed off now. But we're still climbing a bit. We're 120 knots. So that's the trim. And it works just like it works in a real aircraft. It works by feel rather than by pushing, trimming a bit, letting go and seeing if it bobs back up, pushing, trimming a bit, letting go and seeing if it bobs back up. Everything's done by feel as it is in a real aircraft. So if we just turn back to the airport, we put it down again and we'll just emphasise how important it is to have the aircraft trimmed properly on approach. And I'll do that by essentially leaving it trimmed as it is now which is kind of, you know, majorly forward trimmed. And we'll try and put it down and just see what that does to the feel of the aircraft. Now just in passing, you know, in my hurry to get back to the airport, I'm majorly exceeding the <laughs> VNE this aircraft and I'm feeling you know the the weight of the controls has really increased substantially you know especially in the elevator action but also in the aerons I'm feeling that uh, that speed translates into resistance in the controls now I've got to slow down I'll just do a 360 here so we're not doing anything realistic here, we're just um, we're pushing the, the limits of things just for demonstration purposes. Something else to note, if you listen, that's the sound of the fans in this 
this yoke, because I'm holding it back, it's having to do a lot of work and it's heating up and the fans are spinning up and that's going to happen all the way to the ground because I'm going to have to keep holding it keep holding it I'm holding it back holding it back and now we're going to be doing that finessing through the flare I'm doing it but it's tough and I'm all the way back on the yoke there it is. If I turn the sound down, you can still hear those fans working all the way. So there it is, that's the importance of having correct elevator trim over the threshold. I mean ultimately here we're limited by how much force this yoke can exert. And although it's you know pretty strong and it can exert quite a quite a pull, you know it's not going to be something that you can't overcome. Whereas in a real aircraft if you were badly out of trim, you may not even have enough, you know, you may have to use two hands just to get the yoke back. You can hear those fans kind of spinning down now. So I'm going to take another trip out and this time I want to just take a brief look at the autopilot and in particular what the force feedback yoke does connected to the autopilot and then we'll talk about it in a little bit more detail. We switched over to the Twin Otter just because uh, well I know the autopilot better and, it, and it's a better autopilot than the one in the Islander. Now we saw earlier that during the takeoff run the yoke's going to come back to its home position due to the airflow of the elevators and that actually gives us a very useful cue about how fast we're going and it helps us judge the appropriate takeoff speed. Now normally we're having to hand the view up and down, you know I'm using a head tracker here but I have to keep glancing down at the instruments and I can't just do that by glancing down with my eyes because the lack of vertical real estate means we can't see the instruments without panning down. Having that feedback from the yoke helps avoid that as well. So just another thing to look out for. So let's get out of here and then we'll talk about the autopilot. Um, what should I do? Before I take off I'm going to set on the GPS, let's set a direct to course to, we'll say to Israel's farm, which I have as a user waypoint. 13 miles away and we're going to use that with the autopilot after we've taken off. So let's go. So I'm feeling that rumble through the yoke again as we as we go. The yoke's coming back. It's centered now so that's telling me we're pretty much approaching rotation speed so I'll rotate and there it goes. We're showing about 95 knots, so we'll go indicated airspeed hold, engage autopilot, heading mode, make sure we've got the flaps in. Uh, we're going to turn it, I'm going to turn it around to the right. Oops, heading mode, didn't press that hard enough. <laughs> and as we turn, you should see the yoke handle is actually moving. And it's actually moving in step with the yoke in the virtual cockpit. I'm just going to, rather than keep turning manually on heading mode, I'm going to switch in nav mode now. So it should take us round to Israel's farm. We've got 3,000 feet dialed in on the autopilot and that's armed. So we're still in the climb at the moment. You should also see the yoke is moving in and out, so it's adjusting in pitch along with the autopilot. And when we get to 3,000 feet, which is just now actually, it should be trimming forward. So the yoke is moving into a more forward home position as the autopilot settles us down to 3,000 feet. Now that autopilot follow is another feature of FS Force. It's not a default feature, you don't get it in the basic package. You have to buy the additional yoke add-on for the plug-in. And that gives you, essentially it gives you the autopilot follow 
it gives you one other thing which is if you remember when we talked about that um, FSX quite unhelpful scaling of the physical inputs before mapping them onto the virtual controls the yoke module for the FS Force plugin also has a feature called aileron remapping which takes over the control of the ailerons from FSX and it basically restores that scaling to more or less linear, one-to-one -one scaling. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to come off autopilot and we're going to see what happens. What I can see is there's a message comes up in this green box, it says yoke offset 66% forward. So what's happening when we get that yoke offset message when we come off the autopilot? Well, basically the plug-in is trying to make the physical yoke mimic the movements of the virtual yoke and it's only able to do this approximately and I think this is due to the precision or the lack of precision in the certainly in the pitch axis of the yoke. Now I'm guessing this is something to do with the particular way this yoke works with the electromagnetic control actuator but it is only a guess that it doesn't allow very precise subtle very small movements in the pitch axis. The roll axis is something else because that's as I say has a completely different mechanism but in terms of the pitch axis they can get out of step. There's no big deal associated with that, it doesn't affect the controllability all it does is when you come off autopilot it can have moved the centered, central position of the yoke forward or aft by quite a lot but you can continue to fly with no ill effects the only thing is if it's moved it too far to one end of the range you might run out of up or down elevator so there is a function built into FS Force to reset that, you can call it from the menu or I have it mapped to a button you press that and it simply adjusts the, the yoke to compensate for that offset without affecting the controls now that aside, something else I've noticed is when I come off autopilot sometimes I do get an excursion in the pitch attitude, either up or down. As far as I can tell that's a consequence of the way FS Force handles the autopilot. In fact my understanding of this is that FS Force doesn't, when it's on autopilot, it's, it's following the autopilot movements but it's not actually controlling the aircraft. The aircraft is being controlled, I'm talking about in the pitch axis here, by adjustments to the built-in FSX elevator trim control and the FS Force elevator trim system is effectively suspended until you exit the autopilot. Now the problem with that is, as far as I can tell, the setting of the FSX elevator trim can be different when you deactivate the autopilot than it was when you activated the autopilot. And that means when the FS Force elevator trim system tries to pick up where it left off, there's a discrepancy. And that discrepancy results in a pitch up or pitch down. Now if that is the case, there's, it suggests there's an assumption built into the design of FS Force, which is that the setting of the FSX elevator trim is going to be the same when you deactivate the autopilot as it is when you activate the autopilot. And that may or may not be the case. Now, I suppose it, it may be a reasonable assumption, um, given that you're not really supposed to activate the autopilot until the aircraft is fairly well trimmed. And presumably, when you deactivate the autopilot, you're not going to do that in the middle of some aggressive manoeuvre that leaves the trim way off centre. But it's an assumption nevertheless, and it is an assumption that seems to affect the interplay of FS Force and the autopilot. So that's just something else to be aware of if you're going to use the autopilot with FS Force. So we need to say something about setting up your controllers for use with FS Force. You're probably aware there's two different options for mapping your controllers in FSX. One is to use the built-in FSX options settings controls dialog. But a lot of people use FS UIPC to manage their certainly their analog axes but also to manage their buttons and switches. Now there's some things that you need to be aware of if you want to use or if you do use FSU IPC. And in fact FSU IPC 
create some incompatibilities with FS Force. So the first thing you're going to notice is you can set up your axes with FSUIPC and pretty much it seems to work with FS Force up to a point. Now one thing I've done traditionally is to go into the FSX controls dialog and uncheck the checkbox that says enable controllers. And what this does is it means you can map all your buttons and switches and all your axes in FSUIPC and you don't need to worry about collisions with any default mappings that FSX has made. And, and of course you'd be well familiar with the problems this sidesteps. If you plug in a new joystick to FSX or indeed if you unplug an existing joystick and plug it into a different USB port, FSX will create a whole bunch of default mappings for the buttons and switches and the axes without asking you and this just is no end of causing no end of problems in um, things interfering with other things so clicking the enable controllers off gets around that problem now you can't really do that if you're going to use FS Force why not well one good reason why not is if you want to use the facility of FS Force that allows you to program any of its internal functions onto a joystick button and the functions I'm thinking of here are reinitialize, reload FS Force or reset the yoke, remember that thing with the yoke getting out of step you can only program those onto a button on your joystick or your yoke if you have enable controllers checked on the FSX controls dialog the way you program those buttons incidentally is kind of clunky, you have to edit the FS Force config file manually. Now coming back to your analog axes, if you map your analog axes in FSU IPC, you're going to find that FS Force appears to work, but if you're using the yoke add-on for the plugin, my experience is, and having checked this out in the support forum, it appears that for some reason I don't really understand using the autopilot follow mode and having your axis mapped, your elevator axis mapped in FSU IPC can sometimes result in um, maximum nose down trim or I think possibly maximum nose up trim when you disconnect from the autopilot and that's obviously well I mean it's disastrous if you don't do anything about it immediately but even if it's not you know disastrous it's just very unrealistic and completely inconvenient and the solution to that is simply not to use FSU IPC to map the elevator axis. And in fact you don't gain anything from using FSU IPC to map that axis because well, well, well why not? I mean you might think well I can use the null zone and I can use the slope function to tinker with that axis but no um, if you think about it using a null zone on the elevator axis is no longer a sensible thing to do. The problem is the home position of the axis isn't always coincident with that null zone. If you are trimmed way back, the home position of the yoke, the rest position, is now let's say here, but the null zone is back here somewhere. And that doesn't make any sense. It only makes sense if the null zone would travel with the home position of the yoke. And that, that doesn't happen because the null zone is not, is not managed by FS Force. And actually, I've established that even if you map the axis the elevator axis using FSX itself. You can set a null zone, but it doesn't move with the elevator trim. So, so it's something it just doesn't make any sense to do. The other thing is, uh, for exactly the same reasons, if you were to use the slope function in FSU IPC, again that slope function alters the behaviour, I suppose, in the geometrical centre of the range of travel of that axis. Um, and again, that doesn't move with the home position of the yoke. Now it's a different matter for the aileron axis. You can comfortably map the aileron axis either in FSX or in FS UIPC. And with the ailerons, of course, it does make sense to have a null zone. And it may also make sense to have that slope setting set up in FSU IPC to change the you know, sensitivity around the centre. Of course this might remind you of the plug-in yoke modules 
aileron remapping function, um, which does pretty much the same job as using one of the slope settings in FSU IPC. It changes the relationship between the physical movement of the yoke and the movement of the virtual yoke. So really you've got a choice. You can, you can do it the way that you're used to if you use FSU IPC, but you must turn off the aileron remapping function if you do that, because otherwise the two interfere. So it's probably simplest not to use FSU IPC for either of the yoke axes, just to make things simple. So in other words, you set up both the aileron and elevator axes within FSX, make sure they're not set up in FSU IPC. You can add a null zone for the ailerons. I found that uh, pretty essential to do with this yoke. It's extremely twitchy on the approach, otherwise it's very difficult to keep it going in a straight line. And you can turn on, or I recommend you do turn on the aileron remapping function. I'm presuming you have the yoke module as well. And that makes everything worked just fine. Now just one little note on the null zones if you're playing about with it, it it appears if you set a null zone in FSX for the ailerons and then you tinker with it it appears that um, that null zone is ignored if you have aileron remapping enabled but that's only because FS Force reads information about the axis setup including the null zone from the standard.xml file and FSX only updates that file on exit. So in a nutshell you need to set your null zone, restart FSX and FS Force will pick up the null zone and it will work fine. So let's have a look at how we can configure FS Force. We need a program called the FS Force Profile Manager which we run outside of FSX. You can do this while FSX is running, you just need to stop the plugin, which you can do from the add-ons menu, then you can make a change, then you can restart the plugin, and the settings take effect. So no, no need to recycle FSX. So what do we have? Well, we have a list of aircraft installed, and for each one, which profile is in use? It's assigned a default profile for the FSX default aircraft, but that's okay because we can select an aircraft, let's say the A2A Piper Cub, and we can just assign a profile to it from the list of profiles. So if we said the Piper Cub would be a light GA profile. So if we switch over to the Profiles tab, we'll see now the plugin comes with a set of default profiles. I've added two at the bottom here, Twin Otter and Scout, that's for the Relay Scout. I'm also using the Twin Otter profile if we look for the BN2 Islander, I'm using the Twin Otter profile for that. Probably doesn't make sense to I should have called that something else. But that's just a, a generic profile I'm working on for that sort of kind of weight and class of aircraft. N now something to say about these profiles. These are not designed with the Iris Dynamics yoke in mind. These were designed presumably with some other force feedback device. And so they're not, you're going to find they're not particularly suited to the iris yoke. What you need to do is either edit these generic profiles to be more suitable for the iris device because all force feedback devices are going to have different capabilities and actually feel kind of different in use. So you can either do that or you can just begin to build up your own set of profiles which is kind of what I'm doing. But if we go in and look at the light GA profile and we edit that, we've got a number of tabs here. We've got a tab for the aileron and the elevator axis and that gives us very interestingly an envelope which describes the well for the aileron which describes the centering force as a function of speed there's no centering force so when we get to 62 knots we've got about 20 percent of the available centering force is applied 100% of that force is applied when we get up to about 186 it looks like on here. So that curve describes how the yoke feels in row and elevator by default the two axes are linked together so the same curve applies to both. You can decouple them and play with the elevator centering force independently. I recommend you do that. 
Now it's worth spending a bit of time finessing this for the particular aircraft you're going to be flying because it makes a huge difference to how the aircraft feels uh, and really to the realism of the force feedback. What else do we have? We have another tab which gives us static forces. This is friction. So if we twiddle with the yoke while we're sitting at a standstill, we get the illusion of friction in each axis. We get the and also the damping. You know, you can set a, damp, a damping parameter which uh, affects how abruptly you can or can't move the yoke. We've got the elevator weight which we've seen in the sim. That's an important one because it's not so much that the elevator is sitting in the fully down position when we're at a standstill. What's important is how quickly that picks up as we start moving because that's really good feedback about how fast we're going during the takeoff roll. I'm not going to say any more about, about this. You can read about this yourself. Uh, ground effects, again just some finesse here. So by default on this profile we get the basic bump effect as if we're running over grooves on the runway. There's more here that you can set to you know, give us some feedback and engine vibrations and things like that. Braking effects, well, we've seen that in the sim. We've got though the landing impact, that's an important you know, feedback as well. It's kind of nice because you can set this up to let you know how well you're doing. So what you want ideally is if you do a really hard landing you want to get a really hard bump. <laughs> if, you get, if you do a really nice greaser landing you want to get a, a minimal bump and uh, that works really well because you've got feet if you're using what AccuFeel as well and EZCA you know the whole combination of these dynamic motion effects and the sound effects from AccuFeel and the force effects from FS Force they give you a really good combination of feedback during the landing so the options tab again you can look at this for yourself but the important one for me is the trim indicator it's kind of useful to have that. It puts a little gauge in the bottom right hand corner of the window that's only visible whilst the trim is being changed. Then if you have the flight yoke module installed you can set that up. You can set autopilot follow on and off but you can selectively enable it for different aircraft. Um, you may find it... Uh, now that one of the main reasons for doing this is the autopilot follow relies on the default FSX autopilot behavior. If you're using a complex aircraft from somebody like A2A or Aerosoft or PMGG probably, it may be that the autopilot uses custom coded features and, and perhaps the autopilot follow function doesn't work as well. So you can selectively disable it down here let's say for the Lockheed, no let's say for the Lionheart Learjet. You can say autopilot follow on or off or default which is at the moment on. Same with aileron remapping. I've talked about this function at some length. You can apply that globally but you can also enable or disable it selectively for a particular aircraft which is nice. You know that's just nice and flexible. Yoke reset hotkey Again, this is to do with the autopilot follow and the fact that the yoke can get out of step with the virtual yoke. You can assign the reset function to a hotkey. One of the less helpful things about FS Force, uh, and I'm saying this, you know, in, particularly in light of how much it costs, is that many of the, well, I say many, some of the configurable parameters can only be configured by going to the FS Force config file and tweaking parameters there. Now this is a very dirty way to set things up and you know I think for something costing sixty dollars we deserve something slightly more user friendly but charitably some of these are new-ish functions and perhaps in a later version they will be included in the user interface but I mean just the things that I've set up here I mean this is an important one to set up the trim function you need to set a button for the forward trim and a button for the aft trim on one of your joystick controllers and actually the way you discover which controller is very crude indeed joystick 12 button 30 joystick 12 button 31 now in fact it's worth addressing that just in a little bit of detail because I had problems with this at first so this is the syntax you need to use you need to identify the joystick controller 
that has the button on that you want to program you have to decide identify which button it is the way you do that is you go to control panel devices and printers you select any of your now you can see here the my problem is I've got lots of joystick controllers most of them are indistinguishable here because they're Leo Bodner BBI32 boards but you can select any one of these in, in game controller settings Windows gives you this dialog to decide which controller you need for the button you want to program in FS Force you basically have to count down this list to the one you want now you can see why when you've got a lot of these button box interfaces that's a problem and Windows doesn't make it any easier if you go down and select one of these it scrolls the list back to the top every time so if you actually want to count down to to one of these by just counting you know you see it just it makes it very difficult and you can't resize this this is Windows 7 and maybe it's different on Windows 8 or Windows 10 I just happen to know it's probably that third BBI 32 from the bottom and it's joystick 12 let's say let me see if I select that and then go into properties if I twiddle the controller wheel you can see it's those two buttons there buttons 31 and 32 so it's joystick 12 buttons 31 and 32 so we take that information back to the FS Force config file joystick 12 but we have to subtract 1 from the button number it's just another obstacle in our way and then we've got the buttons programmed you can program these two functions onto joystick buttons that's not actually documented but um, I learned from the support forum that you can do that so the Iris Dynamics Dragonfly Force Feedback Yoke in combination with FS Force for Flight Sim 10 now if you're using Flight Sim 10 FSX it doesn't make any sense in my mind to buy this yoke without FS Force it's a very capable piece of equipment but it has to have something to do and I think we've seen that the built-in support for force feedback in FSX is sorely lacking and really not usable and using the yoke in standalone mode really isn't worth the price of admission I mean you know if you're going to use this as the basis of a very realistic aviation training device you may consider that the addition of realistic trim is in itself enough but you know at the hobbyist level I think you'd be wanting more for your money but in combination the iris yoke and the FS Force plug-in add a lot to FSX um, in particular you know you've got the realistic trim obviously but I think more than that, the variation of forces according to speed is a very interesting and very useful feature. And so just to recap, you know, the payoff for that feature is not just the feeling that the aircraft is a weighty um, piece of equipment, that you actually get the feel of physical control surfaces at the other end of your flight yoke, but it's things like being able to judge the takeoff speed and the approach speed um, you know the drop-off of controllability when you're approaching the stall uh, wh one thing I didn't mention you know this yoke's probably going to be very useful if you do aerobatic flying because again you get the variation in the feeling of the controls at various critical stages of maneuvers and of course the other thing is that you can set things up so that different aircraft feel very different so if you are flying a very light single-engined aircraft that's going to feel very different to flying a heavy twin or a jet uh, or, or a glider in, indeed. Now of course some of this is not really about the iris yoke as such it's about FS Force the plug-in and um, you know my first impressions of FS Force were a little bit disappointing but with a bit of perseverance you know I've discovered it's really a very flexible and quite powerful program. I think it's let down by its rather clunky user interface that's going to put a lot of people off you know a couple of things that I couldn't get to work at first there's no clues really about why these things don't work and when you've got to edit config files and stuff to sort things out you know people are going to get very disillusioned with that right right away but uh, you know putting that aside it does work and it works well and particularly the flexibility of 
being able to edit those profiles um, in detail for specific aircraft. Now I should say, if you get one of these yokes and you get FS Force with it, you shouldn't expect instant gratification. You are going to have to do a bit of work tinkering to set up the profiles for your particular aircraft for this particular yoke. And it really does pay dividends spending some time tweaking and things like the the curves that describe the aileron and elevator response to speed. And at the end of the day I think the key benefits of this kind of package are actually quite subtle. You know this is not about turning FSX into an arcade game. So the Iris Yoke itself, I mean this is a very impressive piece of kit. I think its strength really is in the management of the pitch axis. The roll axis, as I pointed out, is a little bit less satisfactory. It is kind of notchy, uh, rough feeling, uh, particularly when you've got higher roll forces set up. I should also point out that although this yoke is very heavy, weighs 28 pounds or about 13 kilos, and um, you don't need to clamp it to the desk, it will actually tip over with you know mac getting towards the maximum roll forces. So you probably at some point do want to think about you know maybe you reach some compromise between how you set it up and whether you need to screw it down. Uh, FS Force again we've got some good ground effects the rumble in the takeoff roll and the rollout after touchdown the touchdown effects break in all of that adds to the realism or perhaps to the authenticity we should say of the experience. The one real big disappointment with FS Force is there's no environment effects. Um, I had expected to get effects of wind shear, gusts on the approach, turbulence, but none of that is simulated and, and I don't really know why. You know, I think it is possible to do this. AccuFeel, A2A's AccuFeel does this as far as I understand it. It enhances the turbulence effects provided by FSX or whatever weather engine you're flying. So it seems to me that FS Force ought to be able to tap into the same weather data and give us turbulence effects. So maybe that will appear in a future version of this software, we can hope. So finally we should talk about the cost. <laughs> the projected price of this yoke when the original Kickstarter campaign was launched was going to be in the region of 800 Canadian dollars. And the reality is it's just way out of that league now. Um, this is by no stretch of the imagination a consumer level product. The price today will cost you in US dollars 2600 US dollars. That's if you specify a PFC handle with the yoke. Without the handle it's 2000 US dollars. You know it's quadrupled in price essentially. And don't forget if you live in Europe you're going to have to pay VAT on top of that and probably import taxes, shipping, you know, £150 probably on top of that, so I'm mixing my currencies here, but uh, you know, this is a fast approaching three and a half thousand US dollars for this yoke, you know, two and a half thousand pounds. You know, one of the things about this yoke that uh, really is an unknown, nobody's had these for more than a month or two to date, it's a very complicated piece of equipment inside. You know, we've got to worry about how long it's going to last, what's going to go wrong with it. One thing that worries me is, I've talked about the fans, there's obviously a cooling issue with this, and you know, one of the things that I have very much in mind is how dusty my PC internals get, and particularly the fans. You know, I have the same worry for this, and so the cooling efficiency may diminish over time and I've not opened this up and you know had a look at how easy it would be to clean it up. So that, you know, longevity really is an unknown. For all that, we can't fault it on build quality. Uh, it worked out of the box, which I wasn't expecting. You know, one of the benefits of having waited two years for this is that we've actually got a mature product. There were a very small number of people got their Kickstarter yokes earlier and really they were getting prototypes and there were lots of problems with those, lots of build quality issues but also lots of you know, reliability issues, problems. But we've got our mature product, we've got a second generation product. Iris at some point redesigned the internals of this yoke. We're given to understand. So should you buy one? Well, as always, it's up to you.
So let's have a bit of a closer look at trim. We're don't. Is it worth that? No. <laughs> Frankly, you know, I don't think I would pay that. And at the end of the day, I think the key benefits of this. Uh, <coughs> that'll do. 